Good evening. Welcome. It is good to see you here this evening on this windy, wind, windy, not Wednesday, windy Good Friday. <clears throat> Whether you're here in person or online, uh, I am absolutely certain God has something wonderful He wants to do in each one of our lives. Maybe you're like me <clears throat> throughout the, the day, starting early this morning. You know, I'm reflecting and thinking about where Jesus was from the Garden of Gethsemane, praying in agony, to his arrest, to being in Annas' courtyard, the high priest, where, G where Peter denies him, to the trials, to the crucifixion, and then now he's in the grave for us. Jesus, early on, set his face. He resolutely determined that he was going to go to Jerusalem. And then, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, Jesus was focused on his mission to go to Jerusalem. He is the Lamb of God who came to seek and to save the lost. He came to... He came to make sure microphones work. <laughs> no, he didn't. He came to give us grace when they don't. He came to save the world. Jesus was absolute in his commitment to do whatever was necessary to seek and to save the lost. His death was the price that was necessary for our life. His resurrection gives us power to be able to live in victory over sin and death and hell. His resurrection, the Bible says, rebooted creation. Sin broke the world. Jesus came to recreate everything. Sin is so awful that nothing but the death of the Son of God could fully pay its penalty. And only the resurrection power of God could fully reset creation and offer us hope and help and the chance for a completely restored relationship with God. Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection, make life and fellowship and wonder and joy and peace with God possible, real, alive. Because Jesus suffered for us on Friday, we don't have to suffer eternal punishment. Because of his suffering, we don't have to remain separated from God. We can have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So tonight, we remember six hours, one Friday, what Jesus did for us. The tone of the service tonight will be somber, but not sad. We have no reason to be sad, Christians. Today is Friday, but Sunday's coming. Sunday we celebrate, but tonight we remember, we reflect, and we say, thank you, thank you, Lord, for the cross. Let's pray together. Jesus, we don't even know how to begin to say thank you for who you are and all you've done for us. But tonight, together, we want to say thank you. We want to remember, we never want to forget what you have done for us. So as we hear the scripture and as we sing together, Holy Spirit, remind us, renew us, and help us as we reflect together on Jesus and his work for us. It's in his powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stand with us tonight and let's lift our voices to the Lamb of God.
to trade the death we owe. Your suffering for our freedom. The Lamb of God in my place. Your blood poured out my sin and erased it was my of grace taken from Luke 23 when they came to the place called the skull they crucified him there along with the criminals one on his right the other on his left and Jesus said father forgive them for they do not know what they are doing and they divided up his clothes by casting lots Grace forgives. A bloodthirsty crowd gathered around Jesus as his beaten and bleeding body was nailed to a cross. They mocked and jeered and cursed him. They adorned him with spit and ridicule. Yet he did not threaten them. What were his first words? His first words were an appeal to the Almighty Father the creator and sustainer of all things. But his plea was not for personal vindication 
or divine intervention. He did not cry out for help as he was being humiliated. Rather, the first words that came out of the Lord's mouth as he hung there in pain, struggling to even breathe, were for our forgiveness. He called out to his Father for us, asking for the removal of our sins to cancel our spiritual debt, to cleanse us from the stain of guilt. There was no anger in his voice, only compassion as he personally pleaded with his Father to place the punishment of our sins on himself so that God might cancel out our record of wrongs and forget that we had ever offended him. Grace understands. Now gathered around the cross were Roman soldiers. They were not there to cry out to the Lord for mercy, but to do their job and hopefully make a little extra money before the weekend. So they gambled for Jesus' soiled garments, hoping to take what was not theirs. Ironically, Jesus hung just above them, ready to give them what they did not earn. They were hoping to make a few dollars. He was offering something everlasting. Though salvation was just an arm's reach away, they did not understand. Jesus was right there. As he watched them scurry after his worn out vestiges, he was peering into their hearts. He saw darkness and emptiness and it evoked his pity and compassion. He knew their need because he understands us. Grace is victorious. Now no one is more undeserving of salvation than these ruthless soldiers who found humor in torturing Jesus. The Savior still bears the nail marks they placed upon his wrists and feet. These will be the only glorious scars allowed in heaven because these are the wounds that provide our healing. But often we are no better than these Romans that nailed Jesus to the cross. How often do we go about our business, our work, our life, scrambling to get a little more when Jesus is right there offering us something better? Jesus went to war for us on the cross. He won the battle for us. He is mighty to save. He is our victor. And he offers us something this world cannot adequately provide. Grace. Reflect on the following scriptures pertaining to the grace of Jesus Christ. Romans 5 says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. In Titus 2, for the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God, while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. Remember his word of grace. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing.
Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said to this disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. Love sacrifices. Some of Jesus' followers also stood at the place called the Skull. The past three years seemed like a blur. Disbelief swept over them. Their sweet fellowship and their deep friendship now stood in stark contrast to the scene before them, the execution of their master. Ordinary things like places they had visited, people they had met, and the once approving crowds they had encountered. They all became very distant. Memories of the extraordinary things that Jesus performed, raising the dead, feeding the 5,000, walking on water, healing the sick and the lame, all of the miracles that demonstrated the promise of life. They all now seemed out of place. They seemed to make little sense. Or was something else happening as Jesus hung on the cross? Love sacrifices for others. And Jesus knows this truth better than the ones who stood before him during this crucifixion. His crucifixion did not stand in contrast to his earthly life. It was the greatest and fullest expression of love in a life whose purpose 
was to show godly love. We now see what this grieving small group could not, that Jesus sacrificed his own life that we may live, and his life was a long line of examples that taught us about true love. Now he was proving that his love was his own real, so real. The Lord Jesus spoke the greatest word of love from the cross without uttering a syllable. Love is selfless. A young girl cried out, doesn't anyone care that I'm hurt? As she sat on the park bench catching her knee, We might excuse these words from an eight-year-old, but we would consider them selfish coming from an adult. According to Luke 6, scriptures tell us that what is in the heart of a man is what comes out of his mouth. When prompted by physical or emotional pain, as this young girl was, you would be surprised at some of the selfish words that came, can come out of us. Now consider the words of our Lord, words that came out as he was being brutally executed. His words tell us exactly what was in his heart, selfless love. He did not cry out for self-pity, He thought of those whom he loved. When he said, Woman, behold your son, he was doing more than making provision for his mother. They are words of selflessness. Each one a golden coin of God's selfless love for us. Each word refined in a genuine heart of love, minted at the cross. Reflect on the following scripture. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity, or are persecuted, or hungry, or destitute, or in danger, or threatened with death? No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ, who loved us. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Dear woman, here is your son. Here is your mother. Thank you.
Sing how marvelous, singing how A word of hope. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 42 and 43. Try for a moment to imagine a world without hope. Try to imagine a world in which you have no hope of avoiding sickness. And once sick, there would be no hope of healing. Try to imagine a world in which there is no hope of bearing children, no hope of finding love, no hope of fulfilling relationships, no hope of life beyond this life. Try to imagine a world without hope and you will find it to be an impossible task. For to imagine a world without hope is to imagine a world without Christ. When Christ's broken body expired upon the cross, all of creation, the universe and everything in it, was forever altered. The universe, everything was altered because until that time, the future of hope lay in the balance. From the fall of man until the death of Christ, Sin reigned on the earth and held men in bondage by unforgiving chains. There was no hope of escape apart from a heavenly miracle, apart from God's intervention. Not willing for his treasured creation to hopelessly suffocate beneath the weight of its sin, our mighty God came down from his throne into our space and our time. As history patiently recorded an act of love never before imagined, God, being rich in mercy, chose to send his Son to live perfectly among sinful men and to die selflessly on our behalf. He was not alone at his death. The scriptures record two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. And the people stood by looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. One of the criminals was hanging beside Jesus, hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he pleaded, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. That day both criminals died, but one, the one clinging to the Savior who was dying at his side, forever enjoyed the inheritance of everlasting life. There is still hope in Christ. 
reflect on the following scriptures pertaining to the hope of Christ. From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. I am counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord, more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. Psalm 130. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Romans 5, 1 through 6. Remember his, his word of hope. I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. word of agony. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama, sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? The suffering of Christ on the cross was beyond calculation. The, the beating piercing of his body, the, the blood lost, the physical pain. And on top of that, the unbelief and rejection by his own Jewish community at the hands of the Gentile leaders. And the scriptures tell us that even his own disciples had abandoned him. Yet there was something that happened to Jesus on the cross that was even more horrific than physical suffering and social alienation. There's the rejection 
by God, by God the Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is aware that he's being abandoned by God, his Father. And in response, he cries out, God has forsaken him. Throughout the history of the church, this utterance has been called the cry of desolation, the cry of dereliction, and the cry of abandonment. For Jesus, someone who knew the intimacy of, intimacy of a deep relationship with his heavenly Father, himself being God, himself one with God, for him, this rejection is a shuddering agony. This is the only time in the gospel record where Jesus refers to God, his Father, as God, not as Father. But why? Why the separation? Why did God the Father abandon his own Son on the cross? Why did he abandon him at what would seem to be his point of greatest need? He did it so that you and I would not be forsaken. He abandoned his son so that you and I, his sons and daughters, would never be abandoned. Jesus was rejected by his father so that we, his people, would never face the rejection that we deserved. Jesus endured the deepest agony imaginable so that we would not. Reflect on the following scriptures pertaining to the atoning work of Jesus Christ from 1 Peter in chapter 2. To this you are called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And from 1 John chapter 4, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Remember his word of agony. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Thank you.
a word about suffering. John 19 says, later knowing that everything had now been finished, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Think about the different kinds of suffering. There's human suffering. These words, I am thirsty, shows us that the God-man, Jesus the Messiah, was fully human. These words are ironic in that the one that spoke the seas into existence and held the waters in his hand is now suffering from thirst. This one who brought water out of the rock in the wilderness for his people and could walk on the water, he could also have provided for his own human need, but his spiritual and physical sufferings were for a purpose. He was a substitute for sinners, so he did not shrink back from any of the pain and shame he bore in our place as he suffered immeasurably on that cross. Isaiah 53 says he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrow, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. Hebrews 2 tells us that he had to be made like us, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of his people. The intense suffering. The words, I am thirsty, also give us a glimpse into the intensity of the Messiah's suffering. Isaiah 53 again tells us it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief because his life is made an offering for sin. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins." The Messiah bearing the Father's holy wrath against sin and sinners is beyond our mind's ability to fully grasp. Jesus had gone many hours without sleep. He had suffered many things at the hands of the Romans. Now his throat is parched along with the other crippling pains he is experiencing. The psalmist talks of Jesus when he writes, My life is poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength has dried up like the sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust and left me for dead. But there's also scriptural suffering. After arranging for John to care for his mother, Jesus, knowing that all his suffering was now finished, said in fulfillment of scripture, I am thirsty. In addition to Psalm 22, which we just heard, Jesus was keenly aware that his death was a fulfillment of other Old Testament uh, prophecies. One text he knew the Romans had yet to fulfill was found in Psalm 69, 21. They gave me poison for food and for my thirst, They gave me sour wine to drink. And right on schedule, the Roman soldiers fulfilled the last prophecy about the Messiah. Even in such intense pain, Jesus is giving careful attention to fulfill the word of God that is without mistake or error. We need to live our lives of thankfulness for Christ, who endured intense spiritual and physical suffering in our place. Reflect on these scriptures that show Jesus' concern for and fulfillment of your thirst. John 7 says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. 
Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. John 6. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. John 4.10. And from Isaiah 55, is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. Even if you have no money, come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the living water of life. From Revelation 21.6. Remember his word of suffering. I am thirsty. Oh, mm-hmm.
A word of finality. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. With the breath of God, the universe begins. Nebulae and stars, galaxies and suns spinning into the seeming infinity of space. And in the midst of the vastness of it all, a tiny stone gently turns in his hands, earth. His spirit hovers over the depths of its face and life begins to take hold of its surface. It grows and blooms into the flower of creation, swaying with the limbs of trees and grasses and happy creatures. And in the midst of the beauty of it all, a tiny shape gently forms in his hands. Man. And as God breathes, man inhales the breath of life. This is how it was meant to be. God, the source of life, and man, utterly dependent on God's sustaining power. This was in the beginning. But because of man's disobedience by eating the fruit of that forbidden tree, death was brought into the world and with it all of our sorrows. This began a different story, the story of sin. This story has been punctuated by wars and atrocities but has been deceptively at work all of the time. Such as when man built a tower to try to reach God, when Esau sold his birthright, when Israel made the golden calf, when David gazed across the whitewashed rooftops of Bathsheba, and even when Judas kissed the face of Jesus. But everything that man begins must have an ending. So here, on this dusty, bald spot of a hill, Jesus breathes in and out the air of a world that he created. Each breath an agony, each word a torture. And lifting himself to speak, he proclaims an ending not to God's story, but to man's. The power of sin has ended. The power of death has ended. The power of the grave is finished forever. No more atonement for sin needed. No more work to justify God is necessary. But God's story is far from over. God's eternal story will continue with the return of Christ when he will put the final stroke to man's sin and cut off the evil one with the breath of his mouth. As it was in the beginning, it will be again a world without end. Amen. So let's reflect on the following scriptures pertaining to the death of Christ and the promise of salvation that it brings. From Romans chapter 5 we read, For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, to be sure, Sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged 
against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if, by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in the condemnation of all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. Listen. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through the righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So remember his word of finality. It is finished. i
word of rest, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Luke 23, 46. Confidence. This simple word beautifully depicts our Savior's final words. Jesus dies with the words of Psalms 31, 5 on his lips. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Historically, this psalm was used as an evening prayer by Jewish families as they entrusted themselves into God's care during the night's sleep. The loud cry that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record is significant because it illustrates the confidence Jesus had as he entrusted his soul to his Father. Let's consider two reasons why Jesus could display such confidence as he utters his last statement. First, there is no greater joy in this life than simple obedience to our Heavenly Father. Obedience brings with it a confidence that we have done what is right and good in spite of the consequences. Jesus' mission on earth was simple, to do his Father's will. None other than Jesus has been perfectly obedient to the Father's will. So with a confident cry, Christ yields up his soul, knowing his work has been accomplished. Neither his life nor death would be in vain. Secondly, Though his physical body was battered and bleeding, Christ knew that his Father would keep his soul safe and uninjured from death. And let us not forget that Christ not only entrusted his own soul to the Father, but also the souls of all who would believe on his name. Christ's work on the cross accomplished salvation for you and for me. So that when our life on earth comes to an end, we too, with confidence, can know that our souls are being preserved by our Heavenly Father. Confidence. Despite the beatings, despite the ridicule, despite the torture and humiliation, our Savior was able to endure with confidence. Why? because he was determined to be obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He came to earth to live and die so that we might live with the Father forever. Knowing his life and death were not in vain, our suffering Savior died with confidence. With one final breath, for all to hear, and with unexpected confidence, Jesus entrusted his precious soul to the only one who could preserve it. Reflect on the following scriptures pertaining to the confidence that we have in Christ for his gift of salvation. He offers this through his sacrifice. Hebrews 5, 5 through 9. Christ did not honor himself by assuming he could become high priest. No, he was chosen by God, who said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And in another passage, God said to him, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest, and he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, 
did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made human in likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in him, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Remember his word of rest. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit.